Elliot Fletcher is newly named chair of the Department of Astronomy and Physics in uh, UC Berkeley and the director of the Theoretical Astrophysics Center. He received his um, Bachelor of Science in Physics from MIT in 95 and his PhD in Astronomy from Harvard in 99. He was a postdoc in the School of Natural Sciences at the Institute for Advanced Study for two years before coming to Berkeley as a faculty member in 2001. As an astrophysics theorist, he worked on a wide range of problems and is the recipient of a number of national awards, including the Alfred P. Sloan Fellowship in 2002, the Packard Fellowship in Science and Engineering in 03, the Warner Prize of the American Astronomical Society in 08, and a Simmons Investigator Award. He's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and he is a highly regarded teacher and public lecturer, and this is his second talk to us. Um, a recent new way to see the universe using gravitational waves teaches us about some of the most exotic objects known and helps solve where in the universe some of our very favorite elements come from, gold, platinum, palladium, and even Californium. Join me in welcoming Dr. Elliot Quartier. Thanks very much. It's a great pleasure to be here today. Um, just a little bit more about myself. So I do theoretical work, meaning I use computers like my laptop, uh, pencil and paper, calculators, big supercomputers, uh, that the National Science Foundation and the Department of Energy have to make predictions and to try to interpret phenomena that observational astronomers see. Uh, one thing I don't actually do, which is always a little embarrassing when I talk to amateur astronomical societies, is know how to use a telescope. Um, <laughs> uh, although, to be fair, that is how I got into astronomy in the first place. I lived uh, out of the country in upstate New York, and we had a telescope when I was growing up, and that's what got me interested in science initially. So, what I want to tell you about today is some discoveries over the last few years that are also uh, closely related to work that I've been doing over the last decade or so. Uh, and it's related, as we'll see, to a broader question of where we come from, uh, where in the universe the building blocks for life and matter that we find here on Earth originated. Um, I think this is probably okay with the lens. Uh, also, feel free if you have questions uh, as I go, feel free to raise your hand, wave your hand, whatever, and ask the questions. I may, in the interest of time, defer some of the questions to the end, just so we can uh, get through the material and give everybody a chance to ask questions. So I want to take you back to high school chemistry, which for me was, uh, was a bit of a nightmare. Um, I'm more of a reductionist even than chemistry, so I like things to be simple. You may not think of it that way, but that's how theoretical physicists think about things. So in chemistry, we organize our understanding of basically everything here on Earth in the form of the periodic table, which orders basically matter from its simplest form, hydrogen, which consists of just a proton and an electron, helium, two protons, two neutrons, two electrons, uh, etc., boron, beryllium, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, up to more complicated elements like iron, uh, gold, uranium, unanilium, which is one of my favorites, <laughs> neodymium, which we'll come back to in a bit. Um, and we know that basically chemical reactions, biological reactions, the functioning of transistors in your computers and your iPhones, right? Much of that can be understood as the interaction between electrons and these basic building blocks of matter and chemistry. In physics, we break things down even more. We think the proton is made of even more fundamental units called quarks, same for neutrons, but we're not really gonna need to go into that in this talk, so this kind of chemistry way of thinking about things will be, will be sufficient for most of what we talk about. One of the great triumphs in astronomy and physics over the last hundred years is that we actually know in some detail where each and every element in the periodic table was produced. 
meaning what is the source out there in the universe that is responsible for most of the carbon in our bones or the oxygen we breathe or the iron in our blood. And if you break that answer down into its simplest form, it takes the following form, that the lightest elements in the periodic table, hydrogen, helium, lithium, uh, were formed in the various, very earliest phases of the history of the universe, uh, the first few minutes of what we call the Big Bang. And then for a long time, for hundreds of millions of years, that was it. So there was no carbon, there was no iron, there were no building blocks of life. It wasn't until stars formed and nuclear fusion, processes that build up heavy elements from light elements in the extremely hot, dense conditions that we find in the interiors of stars and in stellar explosions like the supernova remnant here. So stellar processes built up all of the other elements in the periodic table from the light elements, hydrogen, helium, and lithium, that were produced in the Big Bang. So that's the sort of zeroth order understanding. And in fact, within this kind of part of the story, there's lots of details. Certain types of stars produce carbon, other types of stars produce iron, other types of stars produce oxygen, et cetera. And we understand a lot about which types of stars produce which particular elements. But for the last 50 or 60 years, there has been a major gap in that story, which is that we haven't really understood where most of the heaviest elements in the periodic table were produced. Where in the universe did gold originate? Where in the universe did uranium originate? Where did neodymium originate? Uh, a lot of what are called the rare earth elements, which it turns out are critical for a lot of modern technology. My current favorite uh, fact about neodymium, which is one of the elements that we'll talk about, is I have a grill outside on my deck, and there was nothing to hang my grill tools on. So I went on Amazon and typed in thing for hanging grill tools onto a grill. And it returns neodymium magnets. You can buy some incredibly strong magnets that you stick on the side of the grill. And in fact, it's really hard, even if you pull hard, uh, to detach them from the side of the grill. So it does a great job. So that neodymium, as we'll see, is almost certainly produced uh, in the collision between two neutron stars that happened billions of years ago and eventually made its way here to us on. So that, in fact, is the, the kind of remarkable story that I'll tell you about today, is how the solution of this puzzle of where did these heavy elements in the periodic table originate, that puzzle was solved, or you know, speaking a little more carefully, uh, we had tremendous new insights into the solution of that puzzle by the creation of a new type of telescope that saw the universe in a completely new way. And that new telescope is shown here. I'll talk a little bit more about it later. It's called the LIGO Gravitational Wave Observatory. And it saw the universe in a way that's fundamentally different from any telescope that had ever been built before. So to describe to you a little bit about how LIGO sees the universe and why even that way of describing it, seeing the universe is a little bit of a, a misnomer, let me just remind you that Almost all of the information that we have about the universe in astronomy comes from looking at different types of light. So light, according to physics, light is basically just a combination of electricity and magnetism that moves through space. And light can take on different forms, that ele electric and magnetic disturbance, that wave moving through space can take on different forms. What we really mean by that is that there's a pattern of strong magnetic field, weak magnetic field, strong magnetic field, weak magnetic field that repeats itself in time and space. And depending on how long it takes that pattern to repeat itself, we call that light a different name. Light where the pattern takes a very long distance to repeat itself, we call radio waves. That's the radar or FM or AM, part of the electromagnetic spectrum. By contrast, 
uh, when the distance between the peaks and troughs in this propagating uh, electric and magnetic disturbance is very short. We call that x-rays or gamma rays. These are the x-rays that a dentist or a doctor uses uh, to see through your skull. We're going to take an image of your skull to see if your bone is broken. And there's a very small part of this electromagnetic spectrum, this sliver, right, that is the part of light that we can see with our eyes. Okay? And that's light that ranges from the violet through to the, to the red part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Not coincidentally, our sun puts off most of its light in this visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. It's not a coincidence because we evolved in the presence of the sun, so our eyes evolved to see the light that the sun put out. Presumably, life on other planets where their stars emit light in different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum would have different eyes that would see the universe in a somewhat different way. These are all, though, fundamentally the same fundamental type of information, according to a physicist. It's this combination of electricity and magnetism moving through space. And it's remarkable that sitting here on Earth looking up at the sky with either gamma ray telescopes, X ray telescopes, ultraviolet telescopes, infrared telescopes, or radio telescopes, we've been able to figure out a tremendous amount about the universe. And the reason for that is that different types of light tell us very different things about the universe that we live in. So these are three pictures of exactly the same place on the sky, exactly the same object on the sky. Okay? They look completely different because the pictures are taken with different telescopes. A radio telescope, a telescope like what your eye can see that looks in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, and an X-ray telescope. Each of these uh, points here is actually a galaxy. Each galaxy contains billions of stars. So these are collectively uh, many tens or hundreds of billions of stars emitting the light that we can see. In the x-rays, what you're seeing is that what looks like empty space between those galaxies is not actually empty space. That seemingly empty space, according to this picture, is actually filled with hot gas that shines incredibly brightly in the x-rays. That gas is so hot, it doesn't emit much light in the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, just in the x-ray part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And just to give you a sense of how much our eyes deceive us, there's actually substantially more mass by a factor of 10 or so in this hot gas that you see in the x-ray telescope than in all the galaxies that you see in this and then lastly, uh, in some ways, the most remarkable of these images is what the radio telescope sees. The radio telescope sees that at the center of this system, it's called a cluster of galaxies, many galaxies orbiting around each other due to gravity, there's actually a 10 billion solar mass black hole. That black hole is spewing out into space huge amounts of matter and energy in the form of these directed beams that we call jets. And those then light up as they eventually run into all this hot gas that's far away from them. So this is just to say that by looking at the universe in different ways, we're able to figure out very, very different things about the universe that we live in. And so because of this appreciation of knowledge and astronomy, you know, really starting with the development of radio telescopes, uh, radar in the context of military applications, and scientific applications and then later x-ray telescopes etc astronomy has been pushing out into new ways to see the universe and learning new things as we do that yep. yeah, now, how do you actually get a picture of a radio source so how do you get a picture of a radio source this image here is actually taken with multiple telescopes that are spread uh, across the, uh, the earth and you combine the information from these different telescopes to create an image. So you actually are using the radio telescope to take a picture, and then what's done is that picture is converted into something that you can see with your eyes, right? What the telescope gathers isn't this information. What the telescope gathers is radio waves that you can't see with your eyes, 
And then we have ways of kind of converting that into a sort of fake image that you can make sense of out of your eyes. And so the way to think of this, you should, you should always ask whenever you see a, an image, an astronomical image, especially today, where everything is heavily digitized, right, is what is this information actually telling me? So the colors here are actually telling you how bright the radio source is. So the sort of darker, re sorry, the, the pinkish, almost whitish regions are where the radio source is really bright, and the purplish regions and then fading into black are where the radio source is faint. And so that's how the information from the radio waves has con been converted into information that your eye can process. Great question. Okay. So, um, what are gravitational waves? Well, they're a fundamentally different way of looking at the universe that has nothing to do with light. Okay. In particular, uh, the way I like to think about gravitational waves is that they're a wave that communicates out into space that gravity is changing in time. So imagine that we have two objects orbiting around each other due to their mutual gravitational pull, like in this movie here. This could be two planets orbiting around each other, two stars orbiting around each other, Jupiter orbiting around the sun, two black holes orbiting around each other, two neutron stars orbiting around each other, doesn't matter. Two things going around each other. How does the rest of the universe know that these two objects aren't sitting there fixed in space, but they're actually undergoing this amazing gravitational dance around each other? The way the rest of the universe knows that is that if you're sitting out here looking at this object, the strength of gravity is changing in time as the two objects move around. And that information that the strength of gravity is changing in time is communicated from where these objects are moving around out into the rest of the universe in the form of a wave. A wave that transmits this information of the changing strength of gravity. And this animation tries to convey that to you where you should think of this as the sort of peaks are regions where gravity is a little bit stronger because of how the, where the two objects happen to be in their dance and the troughs are the regions where gravity is a little weaker, and that pattern repeats itself over and over and over again because these two objects are orbiting around each other with a well-defined period that they go around each other. These gravitational waves you'll often see described uh, in a somewhat different way than I've described it here as what are called ripples in space-time. And the reason for that name and that kind of conjuring, that image, uh, is related to our more sophisticated understanding of gravity and gravitational waves, which goes back to Einstein's theories of relativity. So our modern understanding of gravity is quite a bit different than the Newtonian idea that objects produce a force on each other. It's an idea that Mass actually changes the very structure of space and time itself. And so when two objects are moving around, they're actually fundamentally changing the structure of space and time. And that changing structure of space and time travels out in the form of a wave. And that's what's meant by this ripples in space time. And that is a more sophisticated, somewhat more accurate description of what we mean by gravitational waves. But this idea of waves of changing gravity also captures the essence of it as well. Einstein, in 1916, so a little bit over a century ago now, predicted the existence of gravitational waves as a consequence of his theory of general relativity, which is his kind of theory that encompasses, among other things, our modern understanding of gravity. And for a long time, um, physicists actually didn't quite know what to make of gravitational waves. The math of Einstein's theory of relativity is very complicated. For a while, people thought they weren't actually a real wave that could really be detected by a real telescope, but that they were a mathematical artifact of the theory. 
And it wasn't until the 1950s and 1960s that people understood Einstein's theory well enough to realize that gravitational waves were a real thing that you could, in principle, build a telescope to detect. And then the question was, well, what kind of objects in the universe would actually produce a source of gravitational waves that you might have a chance of seeing with a telescope, with a telescope that could detect these kinds of waves? And what you need, as this animation sort of indicates, what you want to have a chance of seeing, detecting, by seeing I really mean detecting, I'll come back to that in a second, what you want to have a chance of detecting these gravitational waves is you want to have two objects near each other, close to each other in fact, so that gravity is strong, the stronger gravity is, the stronger these waves are, and if they're moving around each other fast, that helps too, because then gravity is changing quickly in time, and this pattern travels out, and it repeats itself over and over again more quickly. So ideally, to have the strongest sources of gravitational waves in the universe, you want objects that have very strong gravity that are pretty close to each other. And it turns out that the strongest sources of gravity that we know of in the universe are pretty exotic objects. They're not things that we're familiar with in our solar system. So for example, it's not possible to directly detect the fact that Mercury is moving around the sun, and because it's doing this dance around the sun, it's emitting gravitational waves, uh, that we could, in principle, we could detect those with a telescope here on Earth, but in practice, that's not possible. We indirectly tested Einstein's theory of relativity with Mercury by measuring how its orbit changes in time. That's one of the famous confirmations of general relativity. That was not direct detection of gravitational waves. And that's because the gravity between Mercury and the Sun is actually sort of weak. So what objects have boomingly strong gravity where the chances of detecting these sources of gravitational waves would be the highest? That turns out to be some pretty exotic objects, black holes and neutron stars. So what are neutron stars? This is an artist's conception. This is definitely an artist's conception. <laughs> so neutron stars are sort of a star like the sun, meaning they're an object where gravity's pulling in and something else is pushing out so that the object doesn't collapse under its own gravity. That's what the sun is and that's what the Earth basically is. Um, but it's quite different from the sun in that a neutron star is a star whose mass is similar to the sun, but whose size is about that of a city. So the, the diameter of a neutron star is about the diameter of San Francisco, uh, even accounting for urban sprawl, it's something of that order. Um, and that means the material in a neutron star is packed together way closer than it is in the sun, by a factor of a thousand trillion times. Okay. And as the name suggests, neutron stars are also a little weird in that they're not made mostly of protons and electrons, which is what the sun is mostly made of. It's mostly made of hydrogen. Some helium is mostly made of hydrogen. Neutron stars are mostly made of neutrons. Not entirely. There are some electrons and protons and some more exotic stuff, but they're mostly made of neutrons. Black holes are even more exotic. Black holes are objects where actually this sort of balance between gravity pulling in and other stuff pushing out has been lost, and gravity has won, and the object has just collapsed in on itself. So gravity has won out over every other force we know of in the universe. The object has collapses in on, collapsed in on itself to the point where uh, no information about what's actually going on in the interior of this object can actually get out to a distant observer. Gravity is so strong that it forbids uh, information from escaping from this point of no return called the event horizon. And it turns out neutron stars are actually just a little bit bigger. A neutron star that has a mass of about the mass of the sun is only about two or three times bigger than a black hole that has about the mass of the sun. 
So neutron stars are just barely fighting off gravity and able to not collapse in. So these are the objects in the universe that we know of that produce the strongest sources of gravity. So what then, if you just have a single black hole or neutron star sitting there all by its lonesome, okay, is that a good source of gravitational waves? No, why? Gravity's not changing in time, exactly. So what you want is what you want ideally is two objects where gravity's really strong, two neutron stars, two black holes, or a black hole and a neutron star near each other undergoing this gravitational dance. That's the type of object in the universe that would produce the strongest source uh, of gravitational waves. So this is a uh, computer simulation of this process. This is actually a computer simulation, I'll show it a few times, of two black holes moving around each other under their mutual gravitational pull. As time goes on, they actually get closer and closer to each other, and eventually they collide to form a new black hole. Uh, a single black hole is left behind. Let's watch it again. The pattern here is meant to represent this wave of changing gravity. So the yellow at the peak is strong gravity. At the trough, weak gravity, strong gravity, weak gravity. So that signal of the changing strength of gravity is communicated out into space. At the bottom is another depiction of the same information. Now time is going in this direction. And this pattern shows you the strength of gravity. Strong, weak, strong, weak as these two objects orbit around each other and this wave travels out into space. Again, strong gravity, weak gravity, strong gravity, weak gravity. Notice as time goes on, notice two things. The strength of the signal gets larger, okay? And the distance between the peaks or the distance between the troughs gets smaller. Why is that? As time is going on, the two black holes are getting closer to each other. When two objects are closer to each other, gravity is stronger. So the strength of this wave of changing gravity is larger. When two objects are close to each other, they orbit each other faster. Mercury orbits around the sun faster than the Earth orbits around the sun, which orbits faster than Jupiter orbits around the sun. So that's why as the two objects get closer to each other, Okay, the distance between the peaks gets shorter. They're moving around in that dance fast. Is the Earth falling into the sun? Slowly. Slowly. <laughs> or is the sun getting bigger? So the, the answer that Newton taught us, which is what we largely teach in you know, high school and introductory physics in college, is that the Earth and other planets are on perfect elliptical orbits. If it was just one planet, it would be a perfect elliptical orbit. It goes around forever, ad infinitum. And that's not true in Einstein's theory. In Einstein's theory, because this wave of changing gravity takes out into space energy in the form of this wave, that actually causes the orbit to shrink. That's the reason that the two black holes get closer to each other and eventually collide to form a single black hole in this computer simulation. So technically, the Earth is slowly spiraling into the sun because its orbit is shrinking due to the gravitational waves that are being transferred out into space. But don't worry, that's not how the Earth will die. Uh, the Earth will die when the sun expands to become a giant and incinerates the Earth you know, five billion years or so from now. It would take much, much, much longer than five billion years for the Earth to spiral into the sun by this action of gravitational waves because the strength of gravity between the Earth and the sun is actually pretty weak. By contrast, if these are two black holes that weigh about 10 times the mass of the sun, then this entire computer simulation from when they're, you know, as you can see, like separated by so, spiraling to the end, the whole simulation 
takes less than a second. Okay? That's how long it takes them to spiral in that core. So how do you detect these gravitational waves? Well, you need to build a new type of telescope. This is that telescope, the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, or LIGO for short. There's actually two of these telescopes in the US, uh, one in Hanford, uh, Washington, and one in Livington, Livingston, Louisiana. And I'll come back to why there are two in just a second. The original idea for how to detect gravitational waves that is now used was thought of in the early 1970s. That's when the initial research was done on the design of these telescopes. And then since the mid to late 1990s, they've been progressively building better and better versions of this telescope. The kind of current incarnation turned on in 2015, and actually in, uh, in the first week or so of observations, they detected two colliding black holes, as I'll show you in just a minute. This doesn't look like a normal telescope, right? It's this weird, L-shaped configuration, four kilometer long vacuum tubes. The vacuum tubes are filled with laser light that's bouncing back and forth between mirrors. Let me remind you what I started to talk with, which is that I'm a theoretical physicist, which means that if I'm being completely honest, I have no idea how this telescope actually works. <laughs> and it's amazing to me that they were actually able to make the measurements that they do, because it's an extraordinarily hard experiment. But the essence of what they do is they use this technique of interferometry. For those who know a little bit about the history of physics, this is like a Nicholson interferometer that was used to disprove the existence of an ether, uh, which was a key component of Einstein's thinking about the theory of relativity. Basically, what LIGO does is it measures extraordinarily accurately the distance between two mirrors. There are two mirrors here separated by a border of four kilometers. The light is bouncing back and forth between the mirrors, and you use the properties of the light, for those who are interested, the interference pattern between the light, you use the properties of the light as it bounces back and forth between the mirror to measure extremely accurately the distance between the mirrors. If a gravitational wave happens to go by the telescope, it stretches things apart, pulls them, pushes them together, stretches apart, pushes them together. So the mirrors move a little closer, a little further apart, and you can detect that by measuring the light as it's bouncing back and forth between the mirrors. This is an extraordinarily hard experiment. They have to measure the distance between the mirrors to an accuracy that's smaller by a factor of a thousand than the size of a proton. Another way to think of this is, what is the closest star to us, other than the sun? Okay. <laughs> right? The Proxima Centauri system is the closest star to us. Star system, there's three in the system. And LIGO measures distances to an accuracy that's equivalent to measuring the distance to the Proxima Centauri system, which is measured in light years. It's equivalent to measuring that distance to an accuracy that's comparable to the width of a human hair. Um, so why are there two of these telescopes, one in Washington and one in Louisiana? Well, it turns out that if a truck goes by on the interstate, okay, that causes the distance between the mirrors to change a little bit, and you don't want to get excited and think that that's two colliding black holes out there in the universe. So you build two of these telescopes in different parts of the country, and if both of them see the same thing at almost the same time, then you're much more confident that what you saw is a real source out there in the universe and not a truck and not somebody logging in Louisiana or Washington or somebody shooting at the Livingston, Louisiana uh, facility, which happened a lot in the beginning. Um, so that's why there's two of them. There's actually also a European telescope called Virgo, a Japanese telescope called Kagra. So this is increasingly an international uh, enterprise. So as I said, when LIGO turned on in the fall of 2015 with its most up-to-date incarnation of the telescope, which is, was not very imaginatively called Advanced LIGO, which was better than Enhanced LIGO, <laughs> which was better than Initial LIGO, okay? so they, over time, were in, increasing the sensitivity of the telescope. 
Uh, they very quickly, in September 2015, detected the collision of two black holes. And this is sort of an artist's illustration of what that looks like. This is the actual data. The red and the blue are the data from the two sites, the Louisiana site and the Washington site. And what is measured here, what's shown here, is the strength of the gravitational wave. What's really shown here is essentially the distance between the mirrors. Okay. And what I want you to notice is that this has in it all of the features in that beautiful theoretical calculation that was done, alas, not by me, but by my colleagues, well before the measurement was actually made. Right? You'll notice that as you get closer, as time goes on, the signal gets stronger. As time goes on, the distance between the peaks gets shorter. And that's exactly what we expected to see as two objects spiral and do the emission of gravitational waves. As they get closer, gravity gets stronger, the wave gets larger. As they get closer, things move faster, uh, the orbit gets shorter in time, so the signal repeats itself more quickly. Yep. On, on the right hand side, after the climax, yep. there's still some signal. Is that, is that the, uh, the noise that this is? Yeah, so the question is what's going on here? So this is around the time that the two black holes merge to form a new black hole. Uh, what's left after two black holes collide is a new black hole that's left behind. That black hole kind of shakes around a little bit for a fraction of a second. This whole thing is less than a second long. Um, and then after that, what you're seeing is the fact that the telescope isn't perfect. There's some jitter in the telescope. There's some noise. Uh, the mirrors are shaking around a little bit because they have a temperature and other things like that. So that's the noise, exactly. Um, yep. When, when this was observed, they, they indicated that they have located the events. How did they locate, actually, the other observations? So the question is, how did they know where in the universe this happened? So LIGO figures out where, where on the sky things are uh, in a way that's very, very similar to how your hearing works. So your hearing works by the fact that your two ears are not at the same place. And so there's a difference in time as the sound waves hit your head. Okay, they reach your different eardrums at slightly different times. And you can use that to figure out, okay, the leopard is about to jump at me from over there, or it's about to jump at me from over there. And so they use, it's a similar technique. The two telescopes are on different parts of the Earth. And so the signals actually reach the two telescopes at slightly different times. Uh, and so what's actually been done here is they've shifted the curves for the two telescopes so that they line up in time. And they've used how much the shift was to figure out where on the sky this phenomenon was. Good question. Yep. How does the data indicate it's, that the event was two black holes colliding rather than some other event? So yes, how does this event indicate that it's two black holes colliding? So we can infer from this signal the time it takes the two objects to orbit around each other. That's less than a second, so you can, there's no time here, but the real observations had you know, a time axis, and this pattern repeats itself uh, in a fraction of a second. That tells you that the two objects are, orbit around in, are orbiting around each other in a fraction of a second. The only objects that we know of that can orbit around each other in a fraction of a second are either two neutron stars or two black holes. We can also figure out from the strength of the signal the mass of the objects, each of the two black holes before they collided had a mass of about 30 times the mass of the sun. And it turns out neutron stars don't exist with masses above about two and a half times the mass of the sun. So there's no object in the universe other than a black hole that has the right mass and that is small enough that it can orbit around in a fraction of a second. So that's the reasoning uh, that leads us to conclude that this had to be too loud. Yep. Um, so how fast does the gravitational waves really propagate, or I guess in different ways, kind of like how 
much did you guys actually have to shift the data? Yeah, so the, the shift in data is pretty small. Gravitational waves travel in Einstein's theory of relativity at the speed of light. Um, and in this particular observation, we don't actually have a great way to test that because all we saw was the gravitational waves, so there's no other way to kind of calibrate how fast they were moving. I'll show you a collision of two neutron stars where we saw light and gravitational waves, which confirm that the two waves travel at the same speed to better than a part in a trillion. So it's to high accuracy, we know that they travel at the speed of light. So, yep. Um, if you look at the, at the trace up there, it, it, the left-hand side, the extreme left-hand side, the extreme right-hand side, don't look that different, but they are, uh, obviously, it's a different physical situation after the collision. you think it would be a, the trace would look somehow different. Well, this is noise, and this is noise. So you're just seeing the detector. So there's no actual, all the astrophysical information about the colliding black holes is sort of in this part where there is a difference between the left and the right. Now, the, the, the uh, interferometer does not look at a particular part of the sky. It's an all-sky... The, the interferometer is an all-sky detector. It's, it's more sensitive slightly in certain directions, but it's sensitive in all directions. Now, now comes the big question. <laughs> Light has a certain speed because of, of, of the electric fields that, that are in it. You can, figure out its speed miraculously in a dark room. Is yep. that by doing scales and wave waves? Yes, by this. Yeah. But gravitation the wave is not an uh, electromagnetic wave. It, it has its, I'm going to use an old-fashioned word to give my idea. It, it, it's an old, it, it's not in the electromagnetic ether, it's in the uh, gravitational ether. How does it happen? They come out to be the same speed. That's not an accident, right? It's I'm, light is Einstein's special theory of relativity. Gravitational waves are Einstein's general theory of relativity. So they're actually intimately related to each other. So the fact that it's predicted to be the same speed that these waves travel at is actually a fundamental building. It's really built into Einstein's theory. So it's well, an important really, what, what makes it the same because they're different? Physically different things. They they are physically different things. So we can talk about this more afterwards. But it's 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 important. I mean, it's not. It's actually important assumptions in Einstein's theory that then lead to many consequences. And those among those consequences are that gravitational waves and light waves travel at the same speed. So let me ask you guys a question. What happens when you have a 30 solar mass black hole and a 30 solar mass black hole merge? What's left behind? What's the mass of the black hole? Less. Something will be less than 60. 60. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you guys have read articles on this. <laughs> so it turns out it's not a 60 solar mass black hole. And the reason is that, again, the gravitational waves take away energy. And they actually take away a lot of energy something like three or four times the mass of the sun worth of energy. So what's left behind is more like the 57 solar mass. Okay, so LIGO has now detected uh, actually dozens of colliding black holes. There's lots of other interesting science that's been done with them. But I'm going to fast forward to August 17th, 2017, as my t-shirt indicates. Uh, when LIGO detected not the collision of two black holes, but the collision of two neutrons. So there had been a tremendous amount of interest and expectation and anticipation about LIGO detecting neutron star collisions and not just black hole collisions. And the basic reason for that is that neutron stars are made of stuff. Weird stuff, mostly neutrons, a little bit of normal, a little bit of neutrons, sorry, a little bit of electrons and protons mostly neutrons, but because it's made of stuff, there's a hope that colliding neutron stars would produce light, in addition to producing this strong source of gravitational waves due to the objects moving around each other very quickly at nearly the speed of light. And indeed, uh, soon after LIGO detected the collision of these two neutron stars in August 2017, astronomers looked at the place on the sky 
where LIGO said the two neutron stars had collided, and they observed at that place on the sky a new source of light that wasn't there before the collision and that disappeared after about a week or so after the collision. And that new source of light is shown in this image. That's the galaxy near which the two neutron stars collided. The collision, we think, happened sort of at the intersection of those two lines where that bright source of light is. This is about a day after the two neutron stars collided. This is two weeks later and that source of light on the sky has disappeared. So how did astronomers even know where to look? This comes back to the question of how do gravitational waves tell us where to look on the sky? And it's actually pretty non-trivial. So this takes you through how it's done. It turns out that at the same time as gravitational waves were detected, a source of gamma rays were detected about one second after the source of gravitational waves. The gamma rays, pause that for one sec, come back to this. So this sort of animation shows you a representation of the entire sky. That's up, that's down, it's the entire sky projected onto like a projection of a map. The gamma rays told us that the source was somewhere there. The gravitational wave telescopes told us that the source was somewhere in this weird banana-shaped region up there, down there. The intersection of that weird banana-shaped region and that was this region here. A little bit of information from the European, European Gravitational Telescope. And then what astronomers did is they basically just looked at every galaxy within that banana-shaped region for a new source of light. Okay. It also helps that LIGO tells you roughly the distance of the object, in this case about 100 million light years away. And it turns out there weren't that many galaxies in that banana-shaped region of the sky. Uh, and so it was possible, in fact that's shown towards the end of this little animation, which I'm going to skip over, but at the end it showed you there were like 40 or 50 big galaxies in that part of the sky, and roughly the fifth one that astronomers looked at <coughs> had this new source of light that is then the one that's shown in this particular thing. So figuring out where to look was actually an interesting detective story unto itself. This is probably the single most observed object in the history of astronomy. Uh, almost every observatory on the Earth or in space that could look at this new source of light did. That includes uh, observatories that are on every continent uh, in the world, including the South Pole, including, you know, off the coast of Madagascar, Australia, Hawaii, these are the LIGO telescopes in the U.S., telescopes in Chile, um, a bunch of telescopes in space. Something like a third of the world's astronomers were involved in studying the light and the gravitational wave from this event. Uh, to give you a sense of what that means in practice, we have different ways of conveying in published literature our scientific results. And one of them is what's called a letter. So a letter is supposed to be a really short paper that succinctly conveys in just a few pages some really new and exciting results. Usually they're less than four pages long. Uh, and the idea is you limit yourself to four pages. Uh, to get across some new result that you want everybody to find out really quickly and not have to read 30 pages. This is one of the uh, letters that was written uh, associated with this discovery. This particular letter is 109 pages long. The scientific content of this letter is indeed about five or six pages. 109 minus six, that's 103. There's 103 pages of authors' names, <laughs> authors' institutional affiliations, and the various places that the authors got money from to do their research. <laughs> and that's what happens when you have thousands and thousands of astronomers on the same paper because they were all involved in studying this. Okay, so back to this event. So where does the light actually come from? What produces the light? 
how does this collision of two neutron stars produce this source of light that appears and then fades away? We know of other phenomena in the universe that are qualitatively like this, where you look up at the sky and there's a new star that appears in the sky one night and then disappears. That's called a nova, okay, new source of light, or a supernova, a really bright new source of light. Nova, we now know, are explosions of stuff on the surface of a white dwarf that ejects some material out into space. The white dwarf is still left behind. Supernovae come in different types. They can be complete explosions of white dwarfs. They can be collapse of a star to form a neutron star or black hole that blows away the outer part of the star. So the collapse of a massive star at the end of its life. This is a similar in some way source of light, uh, produced though in this collision between two neutron stars. What happens is that during the collision between two neutron stars, not all of the matter ends up in the object at the center that's left behind after the collision. And incidentally, we think that in most cases, when two neutron stars collide, because you can't have a neutron star, with a mass above about two and a half, 2.6 times the mass of the sun. And because it turns out most neutron stars have masses of 1.3 or 1.4 times the mass of the sun, when two neutron stars collide, most of them probably leave behind a black hole. Okay. Most of the time, not all the time, but most of the time. But during that collision of two neutron stars, it turns out some material is actually flung out into space. And it's that material that's flung out into space that actually produces the light that we can see and that we studied intently with our telescopes. What happens is the material that's flung out into space during the collision between two neutron stars, well, it's initially mostly neutrons with a little bit of protons and electrons. But as it expands out into space, those neutrons and protons and electrons want to combine together to form new elements. What elements do they form? Well, they form whatever elements you can form in nature that consist of mostly neutrons and some electrons and protons. And the elements that you can form in nature that consist of mostly neutrons and some electrons and protons are the heaviest elements in the periodic Helium, two protons, two neutrons. Carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, even iron, mostly neutrons, mostly equal number of neutrons and protons. The heaviest elements actually have more neutrons than protons. So what you form by basically fusion type processes, when you throw out into space this neutron star debris, is you form these unusual heavy elements in the periodic table uh, that are made of primarily neutrons. Things indeed like gold, platinum, uranium, californium, uranium, neodymium, et cetera. Some of the elements that are produced okay, are radioactively unstable. Most elements, actually, if you just randomly put together some neutrons and protons to form elements, what you will create will be something that isn't stable. It'll be something that decays. So what's produced in the debris from colliding neutron stars is basically an expanding cloud of uranium, gold, berkelium, californium, unanilium, platinum, neodymium, dyspraseum, and all kinds of funky sounding elements that really exist, okay? Many of which are actually radioactively unstable. That expanding debris cloud that's radioactively unstable stays hot precisely because it's radioactive. The radioactive decay of elements created in that debris cloud keeps it hot and allows it to stay bright and shine as the cloud expands into space. And that's what's shown in this animation here. On the right is sort of a cartoon of what we think maybe the geometry looks like. We think maybe there's actually two parts to this expanding debris, debris cloud, a part that's more spherical, shown there, and a part that's a little bit more like a donut that's kind Imagine a pretty cool donut, a donut that is initially small and expands out into space and gets bigger and bigger 
as time goes on, and that's what's shown kind of in the gold regions here. And this shows from theoretical calculations that we actually did at Berkeley, led by my colleague Dan Kaysen. This shows how bright this expanding radioactive debris cloud would be uh, in two different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. The blue is stuff that you can see with your eyes, and the red is the infrared part of the electro electromagnetic spectrum, wavelengths a little bit longer than what your eye can see. This basic explanation for the origin of the light produced in the colliding neutron star is actually very similar to what enables supernovae explosions to shine. Supernovae explosions shine uh, in visible light because of the radioactive decay of nickel, which decays into iron. This neutron star debris cloud shines because of the radioactive decay of more exotic elements, okay, gold, platinum, etc., which decay, keeping that cloud hot and allowing it to stay bright for of order a week or so as this cloud expands into space. And in astronomy, one of the things we've learned over a century of work, one of the things we're very good at is using the information that we get in the light from astronomical objects to try to figure out what that gas that's emitting that light is actually made of. The reason we know that the sun is mostly hydrogen with some helium and carbon and nitrogen, oxygen, iron, et cetera, is because we've measured in great detail the spectrum, the light from the sun, and seen signatures of the different elements that make up the sun. And in a similar, not as accurate, but in a qualitatively similar way, we've been able to use the light seen from this colliding neutron star to constrain what elements were produced. The, because this is the first time we've seen this, it's sort of like the first observations of a star trying to figure out its composition. I can't tell you exactly how much gold there was or exactly how much platinum. We have only rough estimates because it's sort of early days of this science. But we think we're able to constrain what elements were produced, what is needed to explain the source of light that was seen, uh, and hence what elements were produced in this debris cloud produced in the neutron star collision. And the rough numbers, uh, if you want a ballpark number, this one pair of colliding neutron stars uh, we think made over 100 times the mass of the Earth in gold and platinum alone and several times the mass of the moon in Berkeley or California, uh, which when I gave a talk in Princeton, New Jersey, people didn't really seem to care about it. But <laughs> here in California, we're more excited about these uh, elements that were discovered at the Lindsberg. Okay, so I presented this to you as uh, a series of experimental discoveries, and in many ways it was. But uh, in many ways, this also was a triumph of theoretical predictions. And as a theorist, uh, I would uh, feel that I was misleading you if I did not give you a little bit more about that context. I already explained to you how the features in the gravitational wave source were consistent with the predictions of computer simulations of colliding black holes according to general relativity that were made, in fact, of order a decade before the observations were made. And it turns out that that's also true for the light seen from colliding neutron stars. So my group at Berkeley, actually, my former graduate student, Brian Metzger, who's now on the faculty uh, at the University of Columbia, we predicted in 2010 what we thought the light produced by two colliding neutron stars would be. Uh, and we were interested in this for a variety of reasons, one of which was we knew that the gravitational wave telescopes were getting better and better, and that they would eventually detect colliding neutron stars, and we wanted to know what would that look like to normal telescopes that could detect light. And the blue points here are the observations of this source that was detected coincident in time and space with the LIGO gravitational wave event. And the red curve is actually the model that's directly taken from the plots in our 2010 paper. The only thing I've done is I've shifted it up and down. 
because when we make these predictions, we don't know exactly how much debris is flung out into space, and that determines sort of the overall brightness of the event. But to factors of a few, we were able to predict the brightness and how it fades in time with not knowing, right, any observations of this time, kind of celestial phenomena up to that point. So this was based on a theoretical understanding of what happens when two neutron stars collide, roughly how much debris is flung out, roughly what, is, what are the properties of that radioactive cloud as it expands out, and roughly what kind of light does that radioactive cloud produce. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so I'd like to end uh, just by giving you a couple of thoughts on uh, broader morals to take away from this. So Carl Sagan famously said that we are all star stuff. Uh, my colleague Martin Rees has said this a little differently. He said that we are all nuclear waste. <laughs> <laughs> and they both really mean the same thing. What they mean is that all of the building blocks for life, carbon, oxygen, nitrogen in the Earth's atmosphere, iron in our blood, all of those building blocks, right, fundamentally, were produced by nuclear processes in stars. Now, either fusion at the centers of stars like the sun, or stars more massive than the sun, or stellar explosions, supernovae that eject material out into space, stellar winds that drag material from deep in stars to the surface layers and then blow material out into space. That's how the cloud of gas out of which the solar system formed four and a half billion years ago, how did all the carbon and oxygen and nitrogen and neodymium get there? Well, previous to that cloud of gas, there had been other stars that exploded. There had been other stars with winds that spewed out into space all of the material produced by these nuclear processes and stars. And what we now have learned is that inside every one of us, there's literally a little bit of neutron star debris. Our cells have in them, I don't think they're biologically critical, but our cells have in them a little bit of gold uh, that was produced in a neutron star merger that happened billions and billions of years ago. Probably billions of years before the solar system formed. Some neutron stars collided, flung some stuff out into space. That stuff collected into this gas cloud, which then collapsed to form the solar system. And that process is ongoing still to this day. Uh, in addition, and I think in some ways uh, more remarkably, it turns out that uranium is actually quite important for the fact that the Earth is as hospitable as it is. So the Earth undergoes, as many of you know, plate tectonics. That basically means that the interior of the Earth is hot and it's boiling. That does some very bad things, like earthquakes, which we're not a huge fan of here in California. But plate tectonics is actually extraordinarily important for maintaining the Earth's atmosphere to have a reasonable balance between how much carbon and oxygen is in the Earth's atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that volcanoes, which are another byproduct of plate tectonics, spew carbon out into the Earth's atmosphere. And then subduction, so the plates go back down deep into the Earth's interior, that brings material back into the interior, recycles it back into the interior. What keeps the interior of the Earth hot? There's two answers, okay? two parts to the story. One of the parts of the story is that the interior of the Earth is heated by the radioactive decay of uranium and a couple of other elements, potassium. But uranium is an important heat source that keeps the interior of the Earth hot and hence keeps the conditions on the surface here reasonably hospitable. And that uranium, is, as far as we can tell now, produced to a significant extent in colliding neutron stars. So there's a very real sense in which we owe the hospitable, hospitability of Earth uh, to the fact that neutron stars collided billions of years ago and created this uranium. So I'll stop there and answer any other questions you have. Have 
you ask a question? Okay, we'll start with okay. that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, two questions. Um, you said you measured the black hole, the mass of the black hole. I was wondering how you do it. It's obviously easy when you've got two moving around. You've got momentum in there, but when you've got one. Ah, so, how did we measure the mass uh, of the uh, final black hole? This, um, more, maybe more complicated is why the neutral side only have neutrons and what happened to all the uh, yeah, so the first question is, how do we know that um, the two black holes that collided that were roughly each 30 solar masses left behind, not a 60 solar mass object, but a 57 solar mass object? So the, the way that was actually most robustly inferred is that we measured the strength of the gravitational waves, and we knew the distance that the source was from us. So we knew the total energy that was carried away in gravitational waves. And we used equals mc squared to figure out how much mass was taken away. And we inferred then how much mass was left. Okay. The question about why are neutron stars mostly neutrons and why aren't they a little more normal, um, that has to do with how dense they are. So it turns out that as you take electrons and protons and you compress them closer and closer to each other, at some point, the electrons and protons don't want to be separate particles anymore. They want to actually combine together to form neutrons. This is the opposite of what happens to a neutron. A neutron on its own in space will decay into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. But if you cram electrons and protons together, they actually want to combine to form neutrons. And that's why if you take normal matter, but you compress it into a tiny region, you end up with mostly neutrons. Okay, so behind you, yep. Uh, uh, me? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, well, two questions. Uh, that one ring, the center there says the one ring? Yes. What's that about? Oh, yeah, I think you're too young for that. <laughs> so this is, uh, this is from the Lord of the Rings. Well, I've seen the Lord of the Rings. Oh, okay, gold. Is, but I don't understand how it goes to the neutrons. It's gold, it's a gold <laughs> ring. Oh! Yeah. How do you know it's gold? That's all. Nothing, nothing, nothing more profound. Nothing more profound. And the, second, and the second thing is, remember when it had like the two wiggly wave things? It's like one was red and one was blue? Yep. What did that represent? Like so the, the wiggly waves, the red and the blue, were the distance between the mirrors at the two different telescopes in Washington and Louisiana measuring the gravitational waves produced by these two colliding black holes as the waves traveled through the detector. So that was the distance between the mirrors? Yes. Uh, which one was the bottom one? The one that people looked at? So, so this is kind of measuring, at this point the mirrors are slightly further apart. At this point, the mirrors are slightly closer together, or honestly, it could be the other way around. I forget. <laughs> I, see. I forget what's up and what's down in this picture. But one of them is slightly closer together, one is slightly further apart. So, um, yep. uh, I, I know you're just, this is new, but uh, have you, do you know anything about the frequency of these events based on your observations? So yeah. So, right, I didn't, I didn't get into that. Um, so this one event made a lot of gold, platinum, uranium, da, 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 da. okay? It's very hard from one event to determine how often that phenomena happens, but astronomers are really good at guessing like that because we observe a lot of rare phenomena. And I think the simplest way to say it is we have a variety of estimates of how often neutron stars collide. And it's roughly once every 10 or 100,000 years in a galaxy like our own. And if that is right, which we don't really know yet, if that is right, um, then this amount of mass ejected per event is more than enough to produce all of the gold that's in our galaxy. Okay? And I should say, literally 45 minutes before I started to give this talk, one of my postdocs sent me an email saying that LIGO had just announced uh, a new colliding neutron star. He was worried that it wasn't real, that it was some artifact of the detector, and he would let me know later whether it was real or not. So there's at least a finite chance that there's been another one. There was, I should say, LIGO's taking, continuing to take data. Uh, about eight days ago, they announced the first detection of the collision between a neutron star and a black hole, which is really cool. That hadn't been seen before. And a few months ago, they did detect 
uh, another pair of colliding neutron stars, but they were so far away that we didn't see the light from them. So this remains the only one where we've seen both the light and the gravitational waves to date. Um, yep. So when talking about trying to locate the event in space, you mentioned that the time differential between the two signals was used to calculate a location, a direction. But if I heard you right, you also mentioned that LIGO was able to estimate the distance to the event. So how is distance to the event? So the question is, how does LIGO measure the distance to the event? Um, so it doesn't measure it super well, but it measures it OK. So it knew that this was 100 million light years, in between 50 and 150 million light years, something like that. That's the level of accuracy of the distance. And it turns out that the reason for that is it is a little trickier. It's that gravitational waves come in two types what are called two polarizations, and the strength of those two different types of waves changes depending on the orientation of the binary, and the strength of the signal also depends both on the orientation of the binary and on the distance. <coughs> so you can tease out some information about the orientation and the distance using the different types, different polarization of gravitational waves, which they have some constraint on. So that's how it's done. Yep. Go ahead. Uh, just behind the person who says that. Me? Yep. When the neutron stars fling out this material as they collide, not including radioactive decay, are any protons or ed electrons created? There. I think it depends on what you, so the question is, as, as the neutron star flings out this material, um, are any neutrons and protons, sorry, are any protons and electrons created? Um, I think it depends a little bit on how you define the word created, but I would probably say the answer to that would be, would be yes, meaning if you start it's sort of the reverse of the following thought experiment. You start with a ball of pure electrons and protons, and you shrink it in size. At some point, you start to lose how many electrons and protons there are, and you end up with neutrons instead of electrons and protons. So now do the reverse. Take a ball of mostly neutrons and expand it out. The kind of favored state of matter becomes one where there's preferentially electrons and protons. Once the, elect once the neutrons get far apart enough from each other. And in that sense, you've converted some of the energy that was in neutrons to now energy in the form of electrons and protons. So, good question. Oops, sorry, go ahead. Yep. So, I have two questions. An easy one and I think a harder one. The easy one is uh, LIGO functions during the day also. Yes. Okay, that's the easy one. The harder one is, um, to a lay person, can you explain to us if Einstein hadn't come up with the stuff he did at the time he did, would do you expect that modern science would have eventually figured out a lot of what he communicated to us, or would we be a couple of hundred years behind here? Uh, yep. So the first question is: um, LIGO can work during the day, work at night. Gravitational waves travel straight through the Earth, through the Sun. You know not affected much by, by the Earth or the Sun. So you can see a source that's on the other side of the Earth, so yes. Um, the second question, where would we be if Einstein hadn't been born? Um, I'm, I'm largely, I mean, I think that science is driven by the creativity of a small number of people. But I also, so I also think that for the most part, our breakthroughs happen uh, when they happen because the time is right, because other ideas or measurements have created the opportunity for those ideas to come to fruition. So my personal guess, I think relativity, the general theory of relativity is perhaps the most interesting example in the history of physics of this question. I would say special relativity, it's very clear, would have been discovered by other people around the same time. 
Lorentz had done a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the ideas were there. Einstein made some, some critical contributions, but special relativity was very much in the air, both experimentally and theoretically. That's less obvious with the general theory of relativity, so I think it could have taken some decent amount of time, but I, I do think that by now we would have had that theory, and we would have been in a relatively similar place. That's my, my personal, the big big function, 52, he walking, taking all this time to prove whether he's right or wrong. Yeah, that's that's my personal guess. But that's an interesting question. Yep. Um, when you see the two black holes merging, do you assume that these are two galaxies putting, coming together? Yeah, when you and see the when you see the two black holes merging, where did the black holes come from? Are they associated with galaxies? Where were they? Um, so these black holes, because they have masses of about 30 times the mass of the sun, they're not black holes that are sitting at the center of a galaxy. They're just somewhere in the galaxy. Um, our galaxy has uh, millions of black holes that have masses of you know, 10 times the mass of the sun, five times the mass of the sun, 20 times the mass of the sun, something like that. So I think these were, the way to think of where these came from is that uh, most stars, it turns out, are orbiting around other stars. And that means that many white dwarfs, what the sun will become, neutron stars and black holes, end up orbiting around other stars. And sometimes that means a black hole ends up orbiting around another black hole, a neutron star ends up orbiting around another neutron star, etc. Most of the time, those two black holes, when they orbit around each other, are so far away that gravity doesn't have enough time to act in the age of the universe to bring them together and have them collide in less than 13.7 billion years. But occasionally, the two black holes were born close enough to each other that in 13.7 billion years, they've been able to spiral in by the radiation of gravitational waves and collide with each other. And that's what happens in these particular cases. Um, now, you said there's going to be another gravitational wave uh, observatory in space. How does that work? So there's, the question is, there's going to be a gravitational wave observatory in space. That's called LISA, the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna. And it's basically exactly the same telescope as LIGO. It's three mirrors creating a triangle now. Okay, so very similar bouncing light back and forth. Yeah, okay, so the question is, what they have is they have little thrusters and gyroscopes that adjust the position of the mirrors. I mean, what they're, what they're trying to do is have the mirrors just be sitting there in space, freely falling okay, around the Earth. And occasionally what happens is like a little piece of dust hits one of the telescopes <laughs> and kicks it a little bit. And so then they have to adjust things a little bit with these tiny little thrusters. But it's the same basic premise, and it's a different engineering challenge because you're in space, um, but it's the same basic premise of how you detect them. The difference, the reason this is interesting is that those telescopes will be separated by millions of kilometers, not a few kilometers. So they will see gravitational waves where this pattern of strong gravity, weak gravity, repeats itself over much longer distances. And that turns out to correspond to much more massive black holes. So LISA will detect black holes with masses of like a million times the mass of the sun, not 10 times the mass of the sun. And that difference of a factor of 100,000 or a million is because the separation of the mirrors is 100,000 or a million times bigger. So, okay. um, so you and your student had this prediction lying in wait for 10 years before the result popped up. What do you have lying in wait right now? What do you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. Um, I mean, my guess is, so I guess there's two answers to that question. My guess is that this will be the most interesting confirmed prediction in my career, just being, you know, realistically given I don't think it's actually the most interesting work I've done, personally, meaning I think there's other things I've done that have been 
more purely theoretical, less directly about predicting future observations that I think were just harder to do. But I think in terms of predicting observations that will come in the future, I think this will probably be the most interesting. I mean, the one, so I was just, uh, every seven years or so, we get to take a semester off or a year off and just do research, don't have any of my other responsibilities, so I just did that for a semester. And a lot of what I spent my time doing is predicting what it would look like if a star just directly collapsed to a black hole with no explosion at all. So no supernova, okay, just direct collapse to a black hole. What would that actually look like and how might you detect that observationally? And that's something, that's I think a pretty cool prediction that I think will, is feasible to confirm on a 10 year time scale or something like that. All the way in the back. Is, you said that neutron stars have a size limit of two and a half to 2.6 times mass of the sun. Is there a size limit for a black hole? So, yeah. To the best of our, so in Einstein's theory of relativity, there is no constraint on the mass of a black hole. It can be arbitrarily big or arbitrarily small. There are limits. Um, Presumably, you can't have a black hole whose event horizon is bigger in size than the universe itself, so that's like a practical limitation, <laughs> not a conceptual limitation. There is a sort of conceptual limitation on the other side, which is that if the um, size of the event horizon of the black hole is smaller than the size of the electron or a quark, or a proton or something quantum mechanical, then you need a quantum theory of gravity to describe it, and it's likely that such objects can exist. So it's probably the case that there is a mass beneath which you don't have black holes, in principle because of quantum mechanical constraints. But that would be quite low mass compared to any of the masses we're talking about much less, for instance, than the mass of a comet is, just to give you a sense of scale. Yep? Do you have an idea if there's going to be a difference between the signal-to-noise ratio uh, between the uh, ground observatory and the space observatory? So the, yeah, the question is, is there a difference between the signal-to-noise ratio of the ground observatory or the space observatory? The, the space observatory, as it was originally designed, and this has like a complicated history, but the original design was actually the best signal to noise that you could get in the following sense. There are binaries of two white dwarfs orbiting each other in our galaxy, which produce gravitational waves which produce a fundamental noise that you can't get away from, okay, if you're trying to detect colliding black holes in space. And so they designed the detector so that there would, the telescope, so that there'd be no instrumental sources of noise larger than that fundamental limitation. If they indeed reach that, the sensitivity that they would get would be substantially better than the sensitivity of the current ground-based detectors. And what that means in particular is that for doing things like testing very accurately whether the computer simulations of Einstein's theory for what happens when two black holes spiral in and collide, whether those are right, that would be better done from space than from the ground. I can see false positives too would be eliminated. And yeah, I mean you still have, you do still have false positives, you have this stuff about you know, space debris hitting the telescope and giving a thrust. So there's still, there are different types of false positives. You know, generally, as long as it works, if you can do it in space, you end up with more precise measurements. Um, how do you compare Lisa's technical challenge to nanograph? So how do you compare Lisa's technical challenge to nanograph? So nanograph is a, Another way of detecting colliding big black holes, it's from the ground, it uses information about spinning neutron stars called pulsars. It turns out if you, pulsars, spinning neutron stars are basically like clocks, so if you measure two of them in different parts of the sky, and if a gravitational wave is passed by, it changes a little bit the time it takes the light, the pulses from the neutron star to get to us. 
So you can use the time of the, of the arrival of the pulses from the neutron stars to say something about gravitational waves. I think that, um, I think LISA is a far harder technical challenge than nanograv. Nanograv's challenge is whether or not they can find enough pulsars that are good enough clocks um, and are bright enough and are in the right parts of the sky to do their measurement, or really how long it takes them to do their measurement depends on how many they can find. Eventually, given the ones they have already, they'll do an interesting measurement. But it's much, it's, in that sense, it's a bit more, oh, there's nobody from Nanograph here, a bit more about luck than a, a set of really complicated engineering challenges. Well, I think Lisa has just a whole host of interesting technical challenges. So, yeah. What's Big Bang? How do sophisticated people talk about it? Um, <laughs> What's the Big Bang and how do sophisticated <laughs> people talk about it? Uh, I'm not sure I can answer the sophisticated part. Um, I, mean, I think the way, the way I like to think about it is that we have a tremendous amount of evidence that we can understand what was happening in the distant past and we can sort of rewind the history of the universe further and further back. And as we rewind things further and further back in time, what we find is that in the distant past, everything was much closer together. And when things are much closer together, they're also much hotter. And as you go back in time, as a result, on average, the material in the universe gets denser and denser and hotter and hotter. And there becomes a point at which <coughs> that extrapolation back in time stops making any sense because it predicts densities and temperatures that are so extreme that we don't even know what the right laws of physics are to describe those conditions. And that's what the Big Bang model does. And then we have a whole host of speculations about what might be going on at that time, how we might have ended up there in the first place and not in some other state where we were never that dense and hot, what might have come before that? Personally, I have a lot of trouble making any sense out of that one. Just, you know, it's sort of like what came before time. That's like, I, I am not able to conceptualize that very well myself. So, but I, so that's one way of thinking about that question. And then, you know, it's much more mathematical than that. So the more sophisticated understanding is, is actually quite a bit technical. And it's based on, again, understanding of relativity and quantum mechanics, which you need because you have lots of material in a very small week. I wonder, it would seem that uh, as long as we brought up the subject, the Big Bang. I didn't bring it up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we ran into it in the dark. But anyway, uh, it would seem that that thing would be the mother of all black holes. And, and if it was, when you think about it, like a black hole, how did it ever explode? Black holes you know, inside the event, right? And they stay. So the the expansion, the expanding universe in the Big Bang is actually not not coming from a black hole, or it's not a black hole in the following sense. If you just take a patch of the universe when it was much younger and denser and hotter, you take a region this big, and you ask how much mass is in this region. And how does that compare to this radius if this is supposed to be the event horizon of the object? Okay? The answer is that each patch of the universe is actually bigger than the event horizon. So it's not a region kind of contained within a black hole. So in that sense, it's actually conceptually very different from a black hole. The similarity is that both the Big Bang and the interiors of black holes are the two places that we know of in the universe where we need quantum mechanics and gravity. And we need to figure out how they play nicely together, and we don't know how that happens. That's the similarity, but there are important differences that make the sort of expanding universe different from the conditions in a, in a black hole. Okay, one more question. Go ahead. 
would you would gravitational waves be responsible for causing debris from like colliding colliding neutron stars to become like more stable isotopes to like uh, like uh, to like make the gas disappear after a uh, amount of certain amount of time? Yeah, so once the collision happens, you have simultaneously gravitational waves going out into space and this debris going out into space. But very quickly, the gravitational waves stop having any appreciable effect on the matter. So once the matter gets out to the point where you have this radioactive cloud I was showing you that's producing light, the gravitational waves are having essentially no effect on the material. And that's because gravity is actually the weakest force in nature. The electric force and the nuclear forces are much stronger than gravity. Gravity is important when stuff is really close in, like in a black hole or a neutron star. But once it gets spread out, like in the debris cloud, gravity becomes pretty unimportant. Okay, so we should probably stop there.